Yeah, it's been an honor to be at this mystery school. We're now three weeks or so into it, maybe four soon, and uh, we've undertaken a lot together. We've come in with our ego preferences and pushaways, and we have embraced actually this section uh, of going towards let's walk together, but along the journey, Jesus has given us some, some roles such as leader, for some that perhaps were more weak-willed when they came in, Jesus put them into a leader role. Or if they were really strong and rebellious, then it seemed that they got put into a follow role. But it was really to undo the, the preferences and the tendencies to come into that place of humbleness and uh, to just walk with Christ. So we have a beautiful interview now of someone who, who was in a leader role, and Beverly is going to take us through a few journeys as we interview maybe three or four students of the Mystery School. And she's been meeting with them and, and feeling out their heart and would really love to have some encounters that we'd love to share with you. Hello, Sandrina. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for joining me. You know, I remember the moment when you were made the leader of the kitchen team and the four of you have done all the menus and shopping and cooking for the whole mystery school all this time. Could you please tell us some of the healing experiences you've had by being in that role? Yeah, thank you, Beverly. You, you saw it right. I was very surprised when I got the role of leader of the kitchen. Also a bit shocked and overwhelmed. Uh, but I had no clue what I had to do. So that helped a lot. And also that Lisa said, it's not about the food. And at that time, I thought it was a nice idea. It's not about the food, not about the garden, not about the cleaning. And so I, I slept well, and, and, and the first days, Roxanne, the former leader, helped me to see what had to be done. And I, I had no real responsibility for my feeling, so I could, could stay in, it's not about the food. And then I got the leadership fully, and I was so blessed to see that I have a wonderful team with two cooks, and one team member was willing to work so hard. So that was a relief. But then I started thinking that I knew what I had to do because I knew where everything was. I had to make a shopping list. I had to go to the Walmart and I got to know that a little bit. And then the stress came. And the thought, it's not about the food, went a little <laughs> behind. And I sometimes awoke with the thoughts, did I have to do this or that? And, and then the moment came that, that Lisa, who's my head, where I can go to when I have questions, said, well, simplify. It is not about the food. And since then, I really start understanding that even though I know some things here in the world, I know nothing. I have to be led, and now it's happened sometimes <laughs> that I'm led, and, um, and, and yeah, the first I was shocked. I've been very tired sometimes, but I'm very glad, and grateful that I got this function now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Beverly and Sandrina. Our next offering 
introduced something to me that uh, apparently Emily Dickinson was non-dual. So we're going to hear from Myrna, another Mystery School student, share with us a little bit about Emily Dickinson and two of her favorite poems. Thank you, Jason. Emily Dickinson lived most of her later life in isolation, except for her sister. When someone did call on her, you know, in the 1800s, people made calls, um, not on the phone. <laughs> she stayed in her room and spoke to them with the door ajar. She seems to have come to this profound knowledge at times transcendental, only once in a while non-dual, through observing nature, reading Shakespeare, and meditating. When she died, her sister found nearly 1,800 poems wrapped in 40 little booklets hidden in her bureau. Fewer than 10 had been published in her lifetime. Dickinson did not title her poems, so they are known by the first line. Also, she made two or sometimes three final drafts of her poems, so sometimes they are published one way, sometimes another. I selected these two poems because they reflect my feeling at being at Tabla Rasa. The first one is, I'm nobody, who are you? I'm nobody, who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us. Don't tell, they'd advertise you know. How dreary to be somebody. How public like a frog. To tell one's name the live long day to an admiring bog. The second poem is Some Keep the Sabbath Going to Church. I need to explain three words. A bobolink is a bird that has a lovely chirping. A surplus is a liturgical garment worn by priests or ministers, usually about, comes about halfway down. And the sexton is the person who rings the bell, but in this poem, it is the bobolink. Some keep the Sabbath going to church. I keep it staying at home with a bobolink for a chorister, an orchard for a dome. Some keep the Sabbath in surplus. I just wear my wings. And instead of tolling the bell for church, our little sexton sings. God preaches, a noted clergyman, and the sermon is never long. So instead of getting to heaven at last, I'm going all along. Thank you. Thank you, Myrna. It's beautiful. I can't hear those enough. I guess that's why they're classics. <laughs> 